people were fed up. They felt there's corruption. Some companies have to keep the environmental regulations. Others don't. Mm -hmm. Some get money from the Import-Export Bank. Others don't. Absolutely. They were just White fed up women with it. voted for Trump in this last election over Hillary. Yeah, it was pretty remarkable. Uh, uh, one of Obama's staffers called attention to the fact that uh, 26 percent of the electorate were white evangelical Christians. Democrats are more likely than Republicans to consider the nation's diversity and the ability of people to immigrate to the United States as important, while Republicans are more inclined to cite the importance of the use of English and sharing a culture, preferably based on Christian beliefs and European customs. But does this poll even have any value? Does this question have any relevance or any meaning when so many people identify with neither the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or with any religion whatsoever? Does the very question itself, regardless of whether or not the other questions break down these categories further, does the very nature of presenting this information as part of a summary be a representation of the problem at large, which is the dividing of the camps, the asking of the wrong questions, the targeting of the wrong populations? Hi, this is C with Truth Against the Machine, and I'm right outside the East City Bookshop, which is hosting a national best-selling author, a presidential historian, Doug Weed. You are now currently with this book. It's called Game of Thorns. Uh, you're, you take a peek inside, more than a peek, really um, um, unprecedented access into the goings-ons of the Hillary Clinton campaign and the uh, Donald Trump campaign. I had all these uh, insider stories, see, that are coming at me from people on her staff and then people from Trump Tower, I'm, and I wasn't seeing them on television or reading them, and I wasn't seeing them in YouTubes, and I thought, this is too good. <laughs> Somebody's got to write this. So I started jotting some of them down, and. And they came so fast and furious that page after page I was writing, I thought, well, <laughs> I got to do the book. Donald Trump, mm. he was in Trump Tower one day and he was missing his old buddy, Norman Vincent Peale, who was a very positive preacher on Fifth Avenue at, at this Presbyterian church who died. Mm -hmm. He died. So he's watching TV one day and he sees this sexy blonde television evangelist come on the screen and she's talking about how you can hope and make your life better. And he calls her up and he says, gosh, you're terrific. Can you fly up here? So he flies her up to New York. And he, Donald Trump always liked to rent before he'd buy. So he'd rent and he'd live there for a couple of years and he'd walk the pavement and he'd just talk to people and listen to people before he'd buy a thing. So he walked the pavement of the evangelical world with Paula White, the sexy televangelist. At one point he said, Paula, this is Senator Trump. He says, you should know I've been married three times. And Paula says, uh, me too. So she didn't judge him. <laughs> She's as big a sinner as him. So they made a very unlikely pair. Yeah. And the end result is he understood part of the electoral map that Obama got down great, but the national media doesn't understand. And Hillary knew it. Bill knew it. They just couldn't. They just underestimated it. In the Hillary camp, was there a mismanagement or too much of a focus on perception rather than actually targeting the groups that she needed to? Well, the, the particular groups that I mentioned were missed and are missed by mainstream media um, and have been for a long time. And only a month out, they were very conflicted about who to vote for. And when the vote finally came in, it 81% of them voted for Trump. So part of that was Trump and his message, Make America Great Again, but part of it was... Uh, 
Hillary didn't ask for him. There was a Washington mm-hmm. Post headline op-ed written by one of Barack Obama's staffers that said, why did Hillary Clinton lose the white evangelical vote? And it answers in the headline, because she didn't ask for them. Are these characters, are these personalities too managed, uh, unmanaged, real, unreal? Do they have any historical equivalents uh, like through Kennedy and, and Nixon? Um, are, are they uniquely these personalities, and that's what define this election. You know, I think you've really hit on something that 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 uh, resonated with the public. They're so tired of politicians, mm. and the Clintons were superb politicians. I mean, they would poll yeah. a single word. Do we use this word or do we use this word? They'd run a poll to choose the word. There was recently, uh, last week or the week before, um, an AP poll. That, I, that broke down American identity, like how people identified themselves, um, you know, their religion, all these different uh, factors. And there seems to be, if I'm hearing you right, um, a need to identify these groups and target them directly. For example, for many years, CBS Evening News, they had their own uh, exit polls, not anymore. They, they tweak it. They have little, uh, all of the networks have where they tweak it, but they usually rely on AP numbers and then tweak it to make it sound like they've got this big elaborate exit poll thing, but they don't do that anymore. But back when they did it, uh, the CBS uh, television network, their exit poll would ask a voter, are you a fundamentalist Christian? Well, well, Gallup, who polls religion consistently and understands it, showed that only 2% of the country identified themselves as fundamentalist capital F, who, who, whose theology harkens back to the, the fundamentals, the 12 fundamentals. And uh, CBS didn't get that. So they got a skewed number. They had people saying, well, I think what CBS is really wanting to know is, am I a born-again Christian? I think that's what they're asking. So some would say yes. Others would say, hell no, I'm not a fundamentalist. So they'd say no. And so they got a skewed number that absolutely meant nothing to anybody. So a lot of the numbers for years had no significance. Then they started using numbers and... <laughs> They would start using the term evangelical. Mm. Are you an evangelical? Well, the the guy's thinking, uh, no, I'm not an evangelical. I go to the Baptist church down the street. But he didn't know what an evangelical was. Right. So you might as well be asking him, are you phlegmatic? They yeah. may they may are sanguine. They may be sanguine, but they don't know what you're talking about. So so they got skewed numbers. Yeah. And they didn't know the right questions to even ask. The polling often had Hillary Clinton ahead. Um, and in many in many states, or significant states, it turned out to be the exact opposite. What what did you? Um, attribute that to in terms of your research? Well, a lot of the polling uh, uh, reflected the uh, ignorance of the pollsters and the polling companies and the mainstream media in understanding the flyover (laughs) Americans in middle America. A good example, on November 4th, just before the election, only days before the election, Hillary had a bunch of Hollywood stars gather together to do a musical and to get out the vote. So they all got together and they, their music was very colorful and had used the F word pretty prominently, F in this, F in that, uh, used Jesus Christ and other uh, profanity. <laughs> like Jay-Z, but you know the language last night. Oh. 
Ooh. I was thinking, maybe I'll just try it. Should I use that language if I want to vent? Can you imagine if I said that? So he used every word in the book. I won't even use the initials because I'll get in trouble. They'll get me in trouble. He used every word in the book last night. Well, 1% of the American population is Muslim and 70% is Christian. So this was something that drove Barack Obama crazy. He called up to Brooklyn. He said, you're losing the evangelical vote. All you have to do is ask for him, but you're not getting it. They don't want to vote for Donald Trump. They think he's lewd and crude, and but you won't even ask for him. And uh, they didn't take his and advice. And the terrible things he said about uh, Hispanics um, and immigration, he still made an appeal to them. And uh, when the lewd comments came out, he said, I'm so sorry. This isn't like me. Uh, that's terrible. I hate it. I... So he addressed it. And that was what Bill Clinton and Barack Obama were trying to get Hillary to do on some of her missteps. Bill Clinton was saying, you're losing the Catholic vote, unnecessarily so. And it, these uh, emails that had leaked out about the Catholic spring that, that was going to happen after the Clintons came to power, it didn't get a lot of publicity and it didn't get a lot of coverage in the newspaper, but they were being passed from bishop to bishop and diocese to diocese. It was big. John Hoppen, a think tank fellow, said many of the most powerful elements of the conservative movement are all Catholic. It's an amazing bastardization of the faith. They must be attracted to the systematic thought and severely backwards gender relations and must be totally unaware of Christian democracy. Jennifer Palmieri, the communications director for the Clinton campaign, responded that she believes Robert Murdoch, Thompson, and many other conservatives are Catholic because they think it's the most socially acceptable, politically conservative religion. Their rich friends wouldn't understand if they became evangelicals. And Bill Clinton at one point talking to, the, to Hillary's staff and to Hillary, took his cell phone and he threw it off the rooftop of his presidential pad in Little Rock, Arkansas, because he was so mad. And when the election was over, you heard Barack Obama say, I could have won. Mm. I'm confident that if I, if I had run again, and articulated it, I think I could have mobilized a majority of the American people to rally behind. And a lot of people made fun of that. But he was thinking of all the unchecked boxes, these simple things that you do in a campaign. Uh, but they had their reasons. Hil Hillary's argument was if uh, Bill wanted to get out front of this and say, look, no, we're not going to do that. If we go to power, we're not going to try to change the doctrines of the Catholic Church. We have no business being separation of church and state. We don't like them getting involved. We shouldn't get involved in their business. But uh, the Clinton campaign was afraid it would only call attention to a story that a lot of people didn't even know about. Mm -hmm. So in, in retrospect, it was a mistake. It's the framing of... The perceptions, like when you're asking these questions, you make that excellent point that someone's interpretation of the question. Uh, and, and I think that the election was everyone's perception of what was real and what was not. I'm asking for the vote of every single African-American citizen in this country who wants to see a better future. Look how much... African-American communities have suffered under democratic control. To those I say the following, what do you have to lose by trying something new like Trump? What do you have to lose? A good lawyer, if you're a good lawyer, and if the prosecution brings up 122 points, you may have answers to 50 of them, and they may be great answers, but they'll tell you you've got to do all 126. Even if, even if the response is not good, you've got to cover all of them before you send that jury back in that room. So there were a lot of unchecked boxes on Hillary's side.
Welcome to South Carolina. It's we're so glad to have you back. Thank you so much. I'm Nikki Hall. This is my stepmother, Carolyn. How are you? Good to see you. Thank 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 you. <laughs> and you compare that to Trump. He made an appeal to African Americans in spite of all the terrible things that, that were attributed to him. America must reject the bigotry of Hillary Clinton, who sees communities of color only as votes, not as human beings worthy of a better future. No group in America has been more harmed by Hillary Clinton's policies than African Americans. No group. No group. If Hillary Clinton's goal was to inflict pain on the African American community, she could not have done a better job. It's a disgrace. So here comes Trump saying the wrong things, and those rough edges were almost, in a way, reassuring to some people who thought, I want this whole thing screwed up. I, he was the class clown. They thought, I don't like what he says about the fat girl across the room, but I love the fact that he's disrupted the class, and he's poked the nose of the suffocating, dominating teacher. So th I think they were troublemakers, and they saw Trump as a genuine troublemaker, and they saw how irritating he was. So going into your book, uh, I believe there's a story on the night of the election when Hillary Clinton f discovered that she she um, had essentially lost. She revealed herself, the true character of herself. And I don't want to say that in the, in the context of there's a fake Hillary Clinton. I'm, I'm saying it in the context of she was no longer managed. She was outside of the, 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 the gaze of a camera. So I think you were on to something, whereas the others were more politically pure. The night of the election, Hillary lost it. And the first person who told me that, I heard his story, I thought, well, may be true, may not be true, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to touch that. Then I heard it from a second source. said, oh, yeah, she was very upset, and there was profanity and shattering glass and all this. And you were there at the Peninsula Hotel. I was there. I was standing in the hallway. And so I had two sources going. And then I reviewed the tapes. I saw Ed Rendell, the governor of Pennsylvania, on television. I just came from Hillary Sweet. She's very angry. He didn't say broken or dispirited or shocked or he said angry. That fit. Then I went to some of my friends who'd worked for her for many, many years. And I told what I was hearing. I said, this is possible. They said, yep, that's her personality. It's like a light switch. She said uh, she can lose it. When she does, uh, she gets very emotional. So I felt I was... Uh, I was conflicted about whether to even write it because mm. it's almost like voyeurism, yeah. you know, and a person has a right to lose their temper and to be upset when they're shocked by something like that. Right. But I thought, hey, this is part of history. This is who she is. There's good things about her and bad things about her. And this is a shocking moment in her life, and she wasn't ready for it, and, and she lost it. And Bill Clinton in that moment, I'm told, was absolutely stoic. He, he didn't... Mm put his arms around her. He didn't touch her. He didn't open his mouth. He just froze. <laughs> it was uh, 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 something he'd experienced, and he knew that the best way is to stay away, let it, let the storm pass. So it was a very disturbing moment. Well, it, it seems like uh, uh, Bill Clinton, he had experiences. He knew how to handle that situation, and it's not sensational um, in reference to what you were saying. Should I report this? Because it really gives an insight on perhaps who this person was, and maybe even a demonstration of some of those emotions would have better resonated with the population. Yeah, maybe you might be right about that. See, it, it, I, there was certainly part of her that she kept hidden and disciplined, and uh, 
Some have said, they always say that about the political figures. They said it about Kerry. They said it about Dukakis. They say, why couldn't you have been like that when you were running for president? Because they're, but it must be very, very, very hard. So I, I can't find fault with any of them. I, I, I don't know that I could do it. So it's better for me to write about it. <laughs> because you've interviewed several presidents in the past. Um, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, et cetera. Yes. And so you you have um, a trust, a confidence with both the Democratic and the Republican Party. So is there some overarching message or history um, lesson that we could get from your access in this campaign? Boy, <laughs> I don't know. It's it's it, I've focused on the story okay. because to me this this is one of the greatest presidential election stories in American history, especially because it was so unexpected. So uh, Hillary outmanned him five to one. She uh, outfinanced him five to three if you use campaign funds. But if you add soft money and corporate money, she built the largest super PAC in American history and spent it. So total, she outspent him eight to one. She had 240 newspapers endorse her. He had 19. She had a ground game that towered over Barack Obama's ground game, which was the greatest in American history. She had 960,000 volunteers on the ground. Um, so it was, she had academia, she had Hollywood, she had Wall Street, she had the global uh, world bankers. She had everything going for her. So it was such a shock. So it's the story. Thank you very much, uh, Doug Weed. Congratulations on your best selling. And thank you for the insight. I think this is something we can take uh, some wisdom from. Really appreciate, appreciate your time. You. Thank you. Very tedious. I have spent the last 12 years working on my next book, Sibling Rivalry, which is about the brothers and sisters. That's how careful I am and slow I am. But when this one came, I just had to knock it off, and I did.